kind of dedicated to it. It's a tremendously difficult process. Right. Um, so a lot of sort of research, you know, a lot of um, companies are turning to things like GitHub to try to do it more quantitatively because at the end of the day, a resume is not terribly useful no. know, for assessing programmer skill. So you know, having these resources like a geek list um, or in this case a markover, you know, for uh, the design side of the crowd, um, you know, I, I, those are going to be interesting. I think. You know, purely for, I mean, yes, they're useful to the people that use them, but from my perspective as an analyst, they're going to be just as useful for, all right, how do I, you know, sort of more quickly and efficiently identify resources that I might want to work with or hire? Markover was pretty impressive. I mean, we don't really see many tools like that that are meant for the design well, community. And did you, did you catch the bit, uh, um, the note some of people just uh, tweeted this? That, uh, that's a senior in college. That girl who yeah, presented. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally she goes to Notre Dame or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. Good for yeah, her. Yeah, it's fa fantastic. I think Markover is like uh, sort of on the precipice of what like seems to be a lot of people are working on is that like the next generation of real time collaboration, right? And she had the Skype window overlaid, mm -hmm. you know, next yeah. to the annotation yeah. for the video in the audio chat. But like it doesn't really make sense for that to be separate. Well, that should be in every application. Every right. app should be in, empowered to build real-time communication into the apps. I think mean, that's what we're trying to tackle. And I mean, she really like illustrated how powerful that was that we we're going to collaborate. We were going to zoom in on these 10 pixels and talk about it over video. And uh, we want to enable another generation yeah. of apps to do that. And I think we're really just on the front doorstep of, yeah. of, of things like Node and things like Twilio enabling those types of apps to be even more powerful. And it had, the, you know, and it had kind of a, a sense of an activity stream integrated into it as well, which mm -hmm. is just very easy to look at and very sure. easy, to, you know, and then be able to look at the, the designs themselves. Well, I think we're getting pretty close to um, our time here, so I want to thank you guys both for spending, you know, a few minutes just chatting about Node.js, and we'll talk to you guys soon. All right, thanks, Alex. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Steven. Thanks, 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 Cheers. All right, well, we're here live at Node Summit. I'm Alex Williams of SiliconANGLE. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back live in San Francisco, California for Node Summit, uh, the event where Node.js is front and center. The first Node Summit's inaugural conference. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE, with Alex Williams from SiliconANGLE, with our next guest, Glenn Loheed. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. So uh, you're working on some pretty exciting stuff around uh, DevOps. We just launched today our new vertical publication called DevOps Angle, where we're going to be doing in-depth coverage of DevOps, and as uh, was pointed out earlier, Ops Dev, depending upon where you come from. Exactly. Uh, so <laughs> uh, you have an interesting um, uh, development around automation, and it's a big area, you know, configuration management, automation, making all that stuff work automatically, self-healing networks are out there, and you've got all issues around you know, provisioning and deploying, big hot button. Yep. Um, 
Um, give us kind of the state of the union around the marketplace and what you're developing. Well, for us, we uh, we tend to integrate with uh, the technologies that are in that space. So like the Puppet, the Chef, uh, the Enstratus guys, really our specialty is more in the monitoring side. So really we integrate well with those guys because what we're doing is we're providing the visibility into um, the server and some of the application services to be able to trigger um, those automation programs. But one question I have is about you know your your tools and such, and and looking at it, at IT today. And mm -hmm. IT today, you know, is not the people are not trained really for this new environment as much. Yeah, how, how, where's the disconnect? Where where are you starting to see some? You know some abilities for you know for this for this new adoption to really take off. Well, I, I think the thing is is that where we've seen is is that uh, and for us um, the hardest sell for our product is uh, sort of the server admin guys uh, that are over the age of thirty five uh, because they're so used to uh, products like Cacti and, and Nagios from a monitoring perspective. Um, so it's it's hard for them to really get over that hump that oh there's something uh, new that can automate this stuff for me right. Um, but we've seen sort of all the younger guys being able to adopt this stuff very quickly and partially because um, they don't have the sort of decades of experience within that server environment. Mm, and, right. and as the, uh, the infrastructure as a service has come forward more and more and more, running a server is really getting easier. So, uh, you know, the ability for those guys to dig into that server isn't as necessary. So that's really where those experience came from, from those, those older guys, is that you know, they actually had to get there. They actually had to go down to the rack and, and start pulling through this stuff, right? So uh, that's where we, you know, for us, that's where we see the opportunity is being able to provide uh, much easier solutions for these guys. So like you're saying, John, DevOps and Ops Dev, right? Yep. I mean, like the older guys are trying to say, hey, what the heck is this well, stuff? we got systems guys, and we heard from Theo Schlossnagel, who's Ops, bringing up the devil's advocate side of it, is that, you know, Ops and systems, you can't, they don't. Aren't, they aren't supposed to break. Nope. Code breaks. Code says bugs, and they kind of you know iterate and you know developers, developer, developers, and iterate, iterate, iterate. Yep. But you know you're running uh, systems all day long. You know there's there's a little conflict there. So, you know that's where automation really makes sense, right? So how do you make things more uh, reliable in that dynamic environment of configuration and management? Well, I think the thing is is that you know. That's where you know companies like us and uh, those guys from like Chef and Puppet and Instratus can really help, right? Is that we can provide all of that opportunity to make those things happen for them, right? Whereas um, then they can really focus on the application itself. Well, let's talk about your product. So tell sure. the folks out there uh, what you guys do and what you make, and specifically just tell them what the product is, and then we can talk about some of the use sure. cases. So um, what we do is we're uh, a hosted monitoring service. So we look at the uh, uh, machine level, the OS, as well as the application services layers, uh, and we pull all that data back, process it, um, create some derivative metrics, uh, start to visualize it for these individuals, and then you can put all of your alerts on it um, and be able to be monitoring very quickly. And so for us, what we do in our specialty really is is that um, we have a single line install. So uh, it's a w get or curl command, and what that does is that gets embedded into stuff like Puppet and Chef and, um, and Stratus and allows you to be able to spin these things up and then be monitoring, uh, and that's really our specialty, be able to be monitoring those instances from within 45 seconds of them being spun up. So that's really... Where? And who's buying this thing right now? Who's using it? Where are you at in terms of this, this so, the company? Okay, so um, we've just you know we, we've just sort of launched publicly. We've gotten a, a bunch of partners with us, including Joyant, um, that we've you know we're we're partnering with to push our product out there. Uh, the base of our product um, and a lot of the development came from a bunch of. Uh, social game developers. So those guys really have that issue where it's like, we got to spin this stuff up and spin it down because we're dealing with sort of that dinner hour crunch on their game. So really they don't need those 50 servers the whole time, but during you know a specific time when people come home and start playing that game. Come home from school. Exactly. Well, <laughs> partially, yes. Yeah, I mean. So they get crunched. And, yeah. um, but they really want to be able to monitor at the same time, uh, be able to be pulling the statistics back off of those uh, servers. Um, but using traditional solution stuff that was built in the 90s, like Nagios was first release was 1999. So 
um, those technologies don't work in those environments. And so that's really where we see our opportunity is to, yeah, yeah. to fit in and innovate in that area. So tell me about the fit with, tell me a little bit more about the fit with Puppet and Chef and then Stratus. Okay. Can you explain that? So uh, simply like the thing, the thing about um, Puppet and Chef and Instratus, those guys are automation. So really what they're looking at is making it really easy for you to deploy your network, um, be able to manage those things, be able to put updates and push updates through to those guys. So what we do is that we've got the simple one line that can be part of like the recipe with Chef uh, or part of your configuration with Puppet, and it's that simple to get monitoring. Whereas before, you know, monitoring was tons of configuration, setting up your processing server. We take care of all of that. Okay, so it's all taken care of. And, and again, who, who, are the, who are like the core audience that you're trying to reach right now? It's, I, I would say um, for us, the easiest sell tends to be on the dev op and not necessarily the op dev. Yeah, um, I, I would say so. <laughs> the, the thing is, is that those, the guys that are traditional hardcore uh, sysadmin operator type guys, um, they're a little bit harder sell because they're used to uh, very traditional technologies in this way. We saw a lot of uh, a lot of greatness come out of with Amazon. Obviously, the whole history of Amazon is you know pretty pretty significant. You know, saw Right Scale come out with that yep. front end, made it easier. Um, and then now, as we move into the cloud, with other simply some front ends like Puppet and Chef and others um, are creating that simple environment. Yes. What's changed, or anything's changed over the past three years? Uh, in this market. It's been pretty dynamic from what I could see. Not a lot of proven solutions, it's evolving. Can yes. you share with us your, your vision of, uh, or can you share with us your, your view of what happened over the past three years in terms of that market change and kind of what's in front of you? Well, I, I think that's the thing. I think we've seen, um, you know, several years ago, we were still in, in a phase where your business would grow organically. And so your growth curve would obviously still be in that sort of L shape, um, but unlike today where we've seen sort of viral and social growth um, and moving from being able to you know, gain 1,000 users to being able to gain 10,000, 20,000, 100,000, a million users in a day, uh, you know, these products have had to evolve to deal with those situations. And that's where that sort of automation has come in. And those guys have really had to focus on being able to make sure that they can scale and work within that environment. Has so the number one issue been, been provisioning servers and networks or all the above or any one area that's jumping out at you or is it? Yeah, I mean provisioning is definitely uh, a, an ongoing sort of concern, and, and that's where I think we fit in really well, is that we can provide the monitoring as they continue to provision. So what's the Node.js angle for you guys? So for us, um, there's sort of two components. We're, we're uh, a user of Node. Uh, it functions within our system as our internal API, so pulling data from the processing layer into uh, our UI. Um, we also use it for our external API, so anybody who wants to pull data out of our system, they can do it via Node.js. Um, you know, as it turned out and as it sort of became like this cool little virus within our organization, uh, one of our, our developers uh, said, oh, I, you know, we had a, a feature that people really wanted, which was sort of this network connections, TCP, SSH, uh, HTTP. Um, so he prototyped it very quickly in Node, uh, and it turned out to be so stable um, that we just kind of kept it that way. So it's been continually creeping in uh, as we've been using it forward. And then on the second angle is, is that with our partnership with Joyant, um, we're pulling uh, via their API the dtrace data uh, that's being uh, coming out of Node.js ah. on the HTTP layer. Mm -hmm. So we're grabbing that, starting to visualize it, and allowing people to put um, alerts on it. So you're one of the tools that's integrating into dtrace, though. Uh, I mean, that's definitely one part of what we do, absolutely. Well, that's what they were talking about. They say that there needs to be more tools available around Detroit. Yeah, and I think we're going to continue to keep um, innovating in that area. I think that there's uh, so much opportunity with the amount of uh, sheer data that Dtrace can pull out because um, you know we tend to look at stuff a little bit more in the 10,000 foot le level. If you look at how amazing the stuff that Joyant's doing on the Dtrace side, um, it, it's like grain of sand compared to the 10,000 foot level. So it's uh, sometimes it's really overwhelming to look at, um, but if right. you can get the alert at the higher level and right. then dig in, I think it's really valuable. Right. So. For, I guess if I can see why you're using Node.js, it seems like it caught on very quickly, but 
what are some of the other you know real reasons why you're using it well the thing was is that we weren't completely sold um, and within our API, we actually started A-B testing. So we A-B tested against PHP, we A-B tested against Python uh, within our internal API. And it just turned out that, that Node was actually the most effective uh, data mover for us. So, you know, we tested it, uh, and it proved uh, itself to be the best solution for us. So for us, um, that's really why we jumped on. Hmm. It was just the best solution. So... Have, do you have any funding? Are you funded yet? Uh, we've been bootstrapping and uh, doing it ourselves. What's your background? Um, all over the place. Tell us a little Come bit. Come on, share, <laughs> tell us. Um, well, I, I, you know, it, it's mostly on the creative industry side. So uh, I did a, a bunch of movies and a bunch of television series and oh, a bunch yeah? of uh, what, music what, videos. What, what, tell, tell us uh, some of your some of your. Uh, you award, you're a natural with the cube. Then. What do you think of the cube? <laughs> what do you think about this? Uh, it, the lights are very bright. Um, <laughs> no, I like I did you know a ridiculous amount of uh, filmed entertainment. But the thing was, is during that whole time, uh, I was always trying to push on the new media side uh, and on the gaming side, and I was one of the guys that helped create this TV show called Electric Playground, um, okay. which, which is a show that yeah. reviews video games. And, okay. and it was really interesting because it's actually one of the first television shows to evolve out of a web property. So we started with the web property and then moved into film and television. So I started as a web guy and then moved into filmed entertainment. And then as I sort of moved through film and entertainment, I started moving back into web uh, and, and gaming. So... My last company was a company called Dime Rocker, which we tried to create this really cool platform to deliver 3D games to Facebook. Um, and I think we were just a little bit ahead of the curve on that one. And then during that whole experience, we, were, we couldn't get the statistics out of our servers. And so it kind of evolved into uh, me finding a way to be able to pull the metrics out of our servers to be able to monitor them. So thus DevOps, but you know, you began the DevOps journey. Yes. We, we talk about the, on the Cube here, we take all the other events, the big data events, where there's no, in the big data world, the discipline is interesting. You have a lot of creative meets math go, uh, jocks yes. to programmers, all kind of rolled into one. Yes. So you have that interesting talent, not just pure developer. So uh, it's, it's, it's the new skill set, right? Well, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Being the, di um, versatile. It w well, it was really interesting because it was. I I flowed from web to f uh, like that creative industry stuff, and then back from that creative industry right back into web. Well, you know, from Hollywood to the Valley to Hollywood yeah. to the Valley. Yeah, but I'm in I'm in Vancouver, so it's from oh, well, that's a <laughs> Vancouver big, that, North. That's a big film <laughs> hub. That's a big film hub. It's a massive film hub. Yeah. Yeah, we so, so my final question, Glenn, is what's next? What do you see out in front of you? Obviously, you've got a startup, you're bootstrapping it, uh, you probably generate some cash or yep. financing, or whatever that comes in. Yep. Um, what's next for you? How do you see this market evolving? What's the vision? Well, I, I see, you know, I continue to see how um, the, the sort of social and viral growth is going to continue to affect how businesses are built. Um, and I think for us, we just want to be able to help those businesses grow and have them focus more on. Um, the application and keeping it stable as they grow, and then for us, uh, just being there to support them through the monitoring side. Well, great to chat with you, Glenn. Um, no, it's Glenn Lowheed here inside the Cube. Uh, we're at live at Node Summit, um, where all the action is happening. The first conference of its kind, inaugural conference around Node.js. Um, real successful framework with JavaScript, doing well, great performance. Uh, thanks so much for coming to the Cube, and we'll be right back in five minutes.